Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, if you're joining us uh, uh, from the uh, from the US. Uh, depending on where you are, could be also be good evening. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar organized by the Venture Lab of uh, AUC uh, School of Business. I'm extremely delighted to be introducing uh, someone. I'm really honored and privileged to call him a friend. Someone I've known for uh, actually more than 30 years. Someone I've learned a lot from and someone who has been a huge support to, to the school and to me uh, personally over many, many years. Uh, Dr. Osama Hassanin our guest speaker for today's uh, talk on innovations with human impact. If I just focus on the title, I believe it combines two key building blocks for individuals, uh, organizations, uh, and societies. Uh, not just to develop and grow, but also to prosper in a changing and dynamic uh, global marketplace. Uh, the value of human capital uh, comes at the core of societal development and with the power of entrepreneurship and innovation, absolutely the sky's the limit. It is also empowered by the emerging technology platforms and applications, as well as the opportunities enabled through uh, digital transformation, the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, robotics, data analytics, and many, many more applications and platforms that we're using today. They can all help realize the scalable and sustainable impact that the title of the talk addresses. In a time where innovative technology tech-based and tech-enabled startups will remain an invaluable component of economic growth. I should say also it's an invaluable economic engine. We really look forward to listening from uh, Dr. Osama, but let me first very briefly introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Osama Hassanin is an entrepreneur, <clears throat> excuse me, a mentor and a venture capitalist. His interests are diverse. They include, but are not limited to, new company formation, venture capital financing, corporate governance, international business expansion, joint ventures, as well as mergers and acquisitions. Over the years, he chaired, co-founded over 14 different funds and many high-tech startups in the US, the UK, France, and Switzerland. Over the last 40 years, he invested in more than 200 plus technology companies whose current market value is in excess of 200 billion US dollars. And he's also the recipient of the Drucker Award for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He's the chairman of Rising Tide, and he was the chairman and co-founder of several leading edge high-tech uh, startups in the US, UK, France, and Switzerland, including ACC in Santa Barbara, acquired by Ericsson, Algeti, acquired by Corvus, High Deal, acquired by SAP, High Wave uh, listed on Euronext, Netcentrix uh, in France acquired by Converse, and Cypher in Cambridge listed in the London Stock Exchange, and Zong acquired by eBay. He also led the financing of over 80 plus Silicon Valley based companies uh, over the years. He was the EVP of Berkeley International in San Francisco, and chairman of Technocom Ventures in France, as well as president of Newbridge Networks Holding in Canada. Dr. Hassanin was the Willard Brown Distinguished Visiting Professor at the AUC School of Business during the period 2010-2011. He also lectured at Stanford University as well as UC Berkeley and AUC School of Business. He was also guest speaker on entrepreneurship at the White House, MIT, and Harvard University. He served on the board of advisor at the Harvard Center for Middle East Studies and on the board of directors of Relief International, focusing his efforts on education, social entrepreneurship, and women development in the Middle East. He has been a member of our own school strategic advisory board since its inception in 2010. Dr. Hassanin, it's wonderful to host you today. Thank you for making the time. Now I turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ayman Ismail, the Abdul Latif Jamil Endowed Chair of Entrepreneurship and Associate Professor at AUC School of Business and the founding director of the AUC Venture Lab. Dr. Ismail will be the moderator for today's sessions. Ayman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Sharif Kamel, for the kind introduction and for being here with us today and, and uh, joining this wonderful talk with uh, Dr. Osama Hassanin. Um, I first met Dr. Osama in 2011, probably at that point in time, we're having 
very early discussion on establishing an accelerator at AUC. And he was very helpful at that point in time, I remember in those conversations, putting a proposal together. And uh, since then, uh, he's always been there supportive for the school and also inspiring us with many interesting ideas um, with a global perspective. And today we're gonna have a, a wonderful discussion with him. Uh, since we started at that point in time, AUC Venture Lab, uh, which we launched at the school at 2013, has grown substantially. Um, now we've accelerated more than 200 startups, um, 1.6 billion pounds of investments, um, and half of them raising uh, funds. Um, AUC Angels making also investments and mobilizing an angel investment community, and a lot of hackathons, ideation sessions, and a launchpad program that's also coming that's that's contributing to the ecosystem in Egypt and to the university at large. And a lot of this comes to early discussions 10 years ago with uh, Dr. Osama Hassanin and Dean Sharif Kamel that I, I remember when I first joined uh, the university and very happy to have him since then being a friend of the school and a personal friend to many of us. So today, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. I, I don't want to stop between you and the conversation with him. Uh, Dr. Hassanin will talk to us about very interesting uh, innovations coming from different sectors, from artificial intelligence to fintech to micro mobility to health tech, and how they're moving forward interesting new ideas that are coming through a startup pipeline that he's exposed to and he invests in and he works with and mentors every day. And how do they affect our lives? After that, we're going to have discussions with everybody. Please uh, put your questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'll take them. I'll weave them into the conversation with Dr. Hassanin, and um, we hope to have a very interesting discussion with him. Dr. Osama, the floor of you is yours, and looking forward to a very interesting conversation. Thank you very, very, very much. I am actually delighted uh, to be with all of you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, for those who are here in California, sabah al khair. And uh, if you are in uh, Egypt, uh, would love to see you sometimes in December when I come back. So uh, today we'll, uh, exactly as Dr. Sharif and Dr. Ayman have said, we'll be talking about uh, innovation. And we'll also be uh, talking about collaboration uh, that make these innovations uh, impactful on human lives and livelihoods. Please, at any point in time, any ideas or thoughts that you have, uh, please share. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to just maybe put the presentation on my screen. <clears throat> Can you see it? All yep. right. OK, perfect. Ah, uh, this, as you can uh, tell, is uh, San Francisco on a nice day. <laughs> we have had uh, fires and thunderstorms this year and uh, air quality index that uh, resembles, uh, I don't know, Ethiopia <laughs> rather than here. I just wanted to share with you uh, uh, something uh, very, very uh, quick, particularly for the students. Uh, in other words, uh, how have things evolved? Uh, and uh, to some extent, what can we think about when uh, we get down to career and what I would like to be, if you will? Uh, in my case, when I graduated from the University of uh, Alexandria Faculty of Engineering, the presumption was that I was going to be an uh, academe. I was appointed as a uh, Moaid, so as a lecturer. And that gave me the opportunity to apply for a scholarship at the University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada. And uh, interestingly enough, while studying electrical engineering and doing my uh, research for the, mark, for the master's and PhD, I became aware of uh, the MBA program, which I did not know much about at all, and ended up actually in parallel uh, studying MBA and eventually uh, getting uh, the degree, which uh, to some extent was uh, impressive in the minds of the people looking for students to hire, uh, including Bell Canada and Northern Telecom, who hired me and then I moved from uh, Vancouver to uh, Montreal, ended up working for the chairman of Bell Canada, who included me in a team to create the strategic plan for uh, Bell Canada. And in the strategic plan, there were evidences 
that technology was uh, developing in a way that is, was absolutely impressive. And uh, to some extent, we learned at that time that a large company will take about seven to 10 years to develop a product, while a startup may take between two years to three years to develop and deliver the product. So he asked me to look for opportunities uh, to invest in companies that have value propositions that uh, Bell Canada and Northern Telecom can benefit from as well as their clients. Along the way, while doing what is called due diligence, uh, ended up meeting venture capitalists and as a consequence was hired by a company called Berkeley International uh, Capital in uh, San Francisco. And the investments at the time were very much in semiconductors and enterprise uh, software. Coming at the end of the decade of the 1990 and uh, the opportunity of course arises when you're working for a venture capital company or a private equity company to learn more and more about uh, innovation. Maybe at some point in time, even come up with an idea uh, that uh, you would like uh, to implement. And uh, the idea at the time was very straightforward. Uh, routers to connect people and companies and institutions and government uh, to the internet. So that was the beginning of uh, a very, very unusual word, advanced computer communication <laughs> set up in uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, surprisingly enough, I mean, the company is a startup, but we were actually able to uh, sell our product to Walmart, which was the largest company at uh, the time, to Bloomberg uh, and to become a friend with uh, Michael Bloomberg. And interestingly enough, even to the Pentagon uh, and uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the Air Force and uh, the Marine and what have you in the US. And of course, at the time, the name Osama did not frighten them. I was actually able to go to the Pentagon and sit down with the government officials. And actually, they would trust me to connect them to the internet. Uh, time went by, and uh, I'm going to look at uh, just the last uh, 10 years, uh, exactly as Dr. Ayman has said and Dr. Sharif has said. What has been very, very amazing in the last 10 years has been the rise of uh, two waves, if you will. One of them is uh, women leadership, and the other one is social entrepreneurship. Uh, social entrepreneurship is what used to be called, uh, you know, uh, organizations that are dedicated to helping people in need, so NGOs, non-governmental organizations. But now, uh, by calling them social entrepreneurship, they're actually based on innovation and on the human impact. For example, in the case of uh, Takwadi and the C100, these two organizations are focused on business acceleration of entrepreneurs like some of our participants today and to provide them with uh, angel financing and seed stage financing. Uh, the impact has been absolutely incredible. And as far as the participants on the side of the mentorship are concerned, they never ask for what's in it for us, but they would like to make absolutely certain that the entrepreneurs looking for mentorship and for angel financing achieve the objectives that they have in mind. Uh, in the case of Relief International and uh, PSD, uh, these are organizations that uh, have been launched to help particularly uh, the Palestinians and the Syrian refugees to have access to uh, online education and as a consequence, develop the talent and more importantly, find a job outside of uh, the government. Uh, most recently, there has been uh, three very interesting uh, initiatives that uh, maybe some of you would be interested in uh, knowing more about. The Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund has actually been set up in Dubai to help organizations that are looking for uh, financing, non dilutive financing, to expand in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, and via the GCC, including in you know, in uh, India and what have you. So it's a very, very impactful fund and uh, uh, very much focused on uh, major innovations, if you will. Uh, the second one is uh, the Sir Magdi Yaqub uh, Global Heart Foundation. Uh, we have now built uh, two hospitals in Aswan and there is one that is going to be built in uh, Cairo. And it, is, uh, it has been very much focused on born children, newly born children, Surprisingly, in Aswan and in Upper Egypt, if you can possibly believe this, one out of three died of a heart attack and as, before the age of three. And as a consequence, the hospital has actually been uh, set up for predictive analytics and at the same time for uh, the cure. 
And then most recently, uh, in cooperation with the Koreans, uh, set up a so-called sustainability initiative. And that's uh, to move from uh, electric vehicle and making the air clean and into everything that you know about uh, gas emission and what have you. And we're going to talk about a couple of highlights of these initiatives uh, as we go by. The highlights of uh, today's uh, conversation uh, between us is uh, what are the emerging markets and their applications? We will take a slightly deeper dive into artificial intelligence applications, FinTech, which are of interest to many people, the impact of healthcare and the innovations in personalized medicine and uh, the clean technology and sustainability. And I think that by the end, we'll all feel somehow the future is bright. I hope you agree with me. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sharif has mentioned, uh, in the last uh, few years, we've been involved in uh, uh, providing seed stage financing. In other words, we are the first uh, investors in uh, companies across uh, eight different market segments. Uh, some of them may be familiar to you, artificial intelligence, which we will talk about today, including machine intelligence and robotics. The applications of uh, blockchain. Uh, blockchain is now actually used by all the ministries uh, in the UAE for land registration, uh, etc. in addition to the cryptocurrencies. For smart mobility, particularly for autonomous vehicles to save lives. In healthcare, in uh, digital health, which is of course very important right now, as well as uh, remote diagnostics. In uh, clean technology, particularly in uh, renewals. Uh, in fintech, which we will take a deep dive uh, in, that has been an absolutely blossoming uh, industry and business and uh, innovation. Cloud computing with uh, Amazon Web Services, it has become actually the platform now for the deployment of services, including, of course, Facebook. And then in the cybersecurity and infrastructure, uh, we have invested in approximately 75 companies in the last uh, six years. And uh, luckily enough, even during the COVID time, uh, they did not do too badly. But let's start, uh, start with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, our main topic. Imagine that uh, artificial intelligence could contribute uh, in the next 10 years to $15 trillion in the global economy. This is almost the equivalent of the Chinese uh, GDP, of which $6 trillion from increasing productivity and $9 trillion on the consumption side, if you will. <clears throat> More importantly, this year, 40% of the organizations here in the US are planning to use artificial intelligence to boost their organization revenue. So it is a very, very high impact application uh, today. And interestingly enough, 30% of the largest financial institutions are actually investing in artificial intelligence given its impact. Uh, recently, there has been uh, quite an amazing, amazing development in artificial intelligence, uh, and I thought maybe to just uh, share this with you, uh, simply because I did not know about. But apparently, uh, cardiovascular diseases are accountable for one out of every four deaths. 25% of the people who pass away are from uh, cardiovascular diseases. And in the United States, one in every 30 seconds, so can you imagine? every minute there are two people who die from uh, heart diseases. The researchers have developed actually an AI technology to identify whether someone is at a high risk of a fatal heart attack years before it occurs. So as a consequence with the scanning of the heart, there is a refined accuracy of the diagnosis and it can provide the important information about what would happen at an early stage of the disease. So the impact here uh, on saving lives or 25% of the people who die is absolutely incredible. And most of the uh, innovations have actually come from Oxford University. Uh, back in 1984, uh, when I made the first investment in, uh, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, surprisingly, there was only one application and that's uh, to define how much should you pay for insurance. So in other words, artificial intelligence was used to measure uh, what are the risks, for example, of having a fire in your home, what are the costs, and as a consequence, uh, set up the cost of insurance. Uh, today, uh, looking at the left, look at the uh, number of applications between Edge AI. I mean, as you probably know, 
artificial intelligence is used in all the devices uh, that you uh, use, and as a consequence, uh, facial recognition and uh, emotion sensing and what have you. In addition to being used in the medical imaging and diagnostics, in uh, gene sequencing, uh, and most recently in uh, language translation perfectly, for example, in speaking with the Koreans, it is so much easier to use AI to translate from Korean to English and English to Korean than to have actually a translator. And then in autonomous vehicles and e-commerce search and uh, network optimization. So 24 emerging applications, uh, a lot of them are actually being taught uh, at the two universities here, uh, UC Berkeley and uh, uh, Stanford University. And we are in cooperation now with a number of governments uh, in the Middle East, particularly in uh, Kuwait and in Oman, to actually set up AI labs that would enable the students and the entrepreneurs to develop the applications based on what is being taught at uh, the universities here. And everything is online and everything is free. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share with you maybe uh, the highlights of uh, four companies uh, in artificial intelligence uh, that I've had the opportunity to uh, finance, uh, just to see the variety of applications. Uh, in the case of Active Surgical, it's a platform to integrate machine intelligence, artificial intelligence into surgical robotics. So effectively, uh, the, the robot becomes uh, much more impactful than a medical doctor uh, because they can see what is inside and what is outside and they can interpret it in a way that is absolutely correct by design. And as a consequence, uh, we are actually able to perform uh, uh, robotics surgery uh, remotely, if you will, uh, with 100% uh, accuracy. The initial target market is the 7 million, the common so-called laparoscopic uh, procedures, uh, where what happens inside the stomach is usually not seen and uh, with uh, machine vision, machine learning, artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, it can be identified and cured. So here is a startup. Uh, I just highlighted a couple of things here. Uh, the first one is uh, that there is an amazing inbound interest in uh, artificial intelligence and its applications in this particular case in healthcare. And as a consequence, a startup that is two years old, uh, able to raise $30 million with uh, inbound interest from corporations, including Qualcomm and uh, Microsoft. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they are connected with uh, eight major hospitals uh, in the US to pilot 3000 procedures. I mentioned these numbers to say that uh, it is a golden age uh, of entrepreneurship and why? Because surrounded by us are organizations that are looking for the value proposition that we have in mind and as a consequence uh, connect make sure that the product is correct by design. In other words, give us some feedback as to uh, how the product works. And uh, in some instances, of course, like in the case of uh, Active Surgical, uh, invest in the company. Uh, the second one is actually started by a Lebanese, uh, uh, René Morcos, called uh, Art uh, Alice Technology as in artificial intelligence in construction and uh, engineering. And here, he just basically used multiple parameters, including cost, time, and workflow scheduling to ensure that uh, the uh, construction uh, design is correct by design. It so happens that construction is the largest market in the world today, uh, $10 trillion, and very highly fragmented. Here in the US, we have 680,000 companies and 7 million employees. What this company is actually able to generate is a scenario within minutes to uh, calculate uh, exactly uh, the time cost curve and at the same time, uh, how to avoid error and uh, how to complete the design uh, in such a way that uh, the large projects can be safe and, uh, uh, and implemented. The product has been released uh, about a year and a half ago and surprisingly, it has attracted developers and general contractors from uh, the Middle East, uh, the Nordic region, Asia and North America. And today it is planning projects with the, most, uh, with, the, with the world's largest construction company. So the impact here on having construction that is correct by design, and at the same time being accelerated from three years to about uh, three months uh, is uh, truly, truly impressive. 
uh, and the company is actually not too far away from where I am here in the Menlo Park. Uh, MetaWave is another amazing company started by uh, Dr. Maha Ashur. Uh, she is uh, of Algerian uh, origin. Uh, she actually was uh, incubated at the Palo Alto Research Foundation and uh, ended up with an idea to do two things. Uh, one of them is to have sensors for autonomous vehicles. The sensors are actually embedded into the cars to be able to detect what could possibly happen that could uh, create a problem, whether it is a crash or uh, uh, someone crossing the road and what have you. And at the same time, to do it with such a speed uh, like uh, 5G, as you know, is 20 times faster than the current speed of uh, the 5G. So interestingly enough, uh, the company uh, actually uh, went on this uh, uh, dual track of sensors and uh, 5G uh, deployment. And sure enough, companies that you see here on the right, including Hyundai, Toyota, Denso, and Infineon Technology come in and invested in the company to be able to, uh, on the one hand, accelerate the development and the deployment of uh, the sensors for autonomous vehicles, and at the same time, start the deployment of uh, uh, 5G, in other words, ultra high speed of two gigabyte across the world. Uh, all of this is based entirely on AI. Uh, the last one that we will talk about in uh, AI is uh, Quanergy. It was also started by uh, a Lebanese, uh, Dr. Loayel Dada, and the uh, original idea was to have the best product that can be embedded into cars so that at a distance of 200 meters, it can detect uh, anything that the car should avoid, uh, whether it is a truck or a closed road or a pedestrian. Interestingly enough, uh, in the last uh, year, <clears throat> that application of sensors uh, has uh, been augmented using artificial intelligence in applications such as uh, in, the, in the case of COVID applications, uh, the detection of the temperature of the individuals walking, for example, into an airport, the distance uh, between the people walking, uh, uh, the applications uh, in stadium to ensure that people are actually at a distance uh, from uh, each other. And before you know it, in less than one year, <clears throat> that application, which was designed for cars, is now used by 35 countries uh, uh, with uh, Cisco deploying the product uh, for uh, COVID detection and safety and security. Uh, the bottom line here and the takeaway is that uh, while we start with an idea in our mind about what the application could be, and in this case, it would be the application of artificial intelligence for remote sensing in automobiles, as time goes by, uh, we find endless opportunities and as uh, you and I would agree, to save livelihoods uh, and improve lives. Uh, the last one I'm going to mention uh, is uh, Voiceya, which was started by, uh, by two absolutely amazing uh, Egyptians, uh, Omar Tawakkul and uh, Ahmed uh, Abdel Qadir. Uh, the two are truly, truly amazing entrepreneurs in the sense that they have created companies and they have uh, science and technology skills that are so impressive. Uh, in the case of uh, Voiceya, it's really quite a unique experience uh, in the sense that uh, it uses actually application, uh, excuse me, artificial intelligence uh, in boardrooms and in team meetings to extract the key takeaways of the meeting. We are all discussing, like we are discussing today, uh, let's say artificial intelligence, and the Voiceya product would actually capture the things that are being said, the questions uh, that are being asked, the key takeaways and what have you, and then feedback to the organization, what are the takeaways and the responsibilities. As a consequence, uh, the large organizations who actually tested the product were so amazed that they ended up actually investing in the company, including Google, Microsoft, Salesforce.com, and uh, Workday. And uh, Cisco, after investing in the company, six months later, they actually acquired the company. Uh, not a usual application of AI, but very highly impactful one on productivity. Uh, 
If you don't mind, uh, we can uh, move now to uh, FinTech. And uh, as of course, uh, all of us know, at some point in time, we assume that financial technology is a payment and credit card. And today, actually, FinTech is across 10 different applications from wealth management to insurance technology, to real estate uh, mortgage loans, to uh, sales and trading analysis and infrastructure tools on capital markets and to personal uh, finance. And uh, we will see one of the applications here. So the big FinTech sectors are of course, banking, insurance, trading, and uh, security. The market has been absolutely unbelievably blossoming market. Imagine $50 billion being invested in FinTech every year. And if you look at uh, the bottom here, you would see that uh, the application of FinTech in the last four years, let's say in the case of Hong Kong, have more than doubled. In the case of Singapore, which is always uh, the leading edge uh, country in the world in the adoption of innovation, has increased by 4x. And in the case of the United Kingdom, by 5x. And looking up on top, out of two global consumers use insurance for tech as a service that five years ago did not exist. One of the amazing, uh, interesting uh, companies uh, in FinTech was actually started again by a wonderful uh, young Egyptian man, uh, Amr Shadi. Uh, his company, uh, Tribal, uh, has really identified a very, very interesting challenge that there are 200 million small and medium-sized enterprises in emerging economies, whether it is in the Philippines or it is in uh, uh, Nigeria that lack access to formal savings and credit. Uh, in other words, um, that employees cannot have credit cards and cannot buy. And as a consequence, it restricts uh, and uh, slows the growth of these companies. The banking regulation, in addition, make it very, very difficult to open a business account, as uh, some of you may already know, as I know in dealing with uh, some of the French banks. So by using AI-driven uh, approval process, this company, can actually provide the small and medium-sized enterprise to access to payment and complete control over spending and the spending of their employees. The product was launched less than uh, a year ago. And uh, today, uh, they have a lot of demand in startups from the United Arab Emirates, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, of course, and uh, uh, from uh, Mexico uh, for cross-border payments and uh, credit cards. The most interesting thing, again, we are talking about co cooperation and international expansion, is the relationship with Silicon Valley Bank. This bank is actually based here uh, in Silicon Valley. It was only created 35 years ago. And as you know, of course, most of the banks are more than 100 years old. This bank has actually provided financing to 120,000 SMEs in the last 35 years, 120,000. So as a consequence for Amr Shadi and Tribal to cooperate with Silicon Valley is really truly uh, amazing because they have access, of course, to uh, a world-class uh, uh, you know, uh, clients, if, uh, if you will. And at the same time uh, to expand particularly in uh, the GCC where Silicon Valley Bank now is uh, becoming a very, very active uh, participant, if you will. Uh, Interestingly enough about uh, Amr Shadi, his very first company uh, uh, was actually created when he was 22 years old. And uh, uh, it's called uh, TA Telecom and some of you may know it. And of course it's a multi-million dollar enterprise. So it's a very good example actually of the application of FinTech across the world in something that most people aren't actually aware of. Uh, for banks, they don't care about the SMEs. For someone like Amr Shadi, he knows 200 million of them need access through fin, uh, FinTech uh, for uh, credit card payment and uh, cross-border transaction. Let me check the time. I'll be very, very uh, brief here. Uh, healthcare has been uh, one of my passionate uh, verticals for uh, uh, engagement, if uh, you will. And as you can see from some of the highlights here, imagine when 50% of the prescribed drugs fail to treat or cure disease. And sometimes they can actually have an adverse effect, which in the United States leads to 100,000 deaths per year and $100 billion in cost. So in other words, uh, somehow 
uh, prescribed drugs need to be correct by design. And we're going to see maybe a couple of examples of how this can uh, happen. Uh, Aspect Biosystem uh, is a company that was also created by a wonderful Egyptian. Uh, his name is uh, Tamer Mohammed. He is based in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and uh, joined uh, six years ago uh, an initiative that we started like the Venture Lab at uh, AUC. Uh, this one is actually called the Personalized Medicine Initiative. It is an incubator uh, for uh, students and faculty members that have ideas about personalized medicine, meaning the treatment of patients without the use of drugs. That's personalized medicine. Uh, anyone that has a, an idea can actually come in for two years of uh, incubation. And at the same time, uh, we can assist as much as we possibly can uh, in, in securing intellectual property protection and some financing from the government for business acceleration. Uh, this company was started by uh, two professors and two uh, graduate students, including uh, Tamer Mohammed. And surprisingly, he actually was elected by the board uh, and the investors to become the CEO. And he was the youngest person. And why? Uh, because the CEO or the chairman of the board is not the person who is the oldest, it's not me. It is the person that has the highest impact. What this company has done is absolutely amazing. And that is the three-dimensional printing of human tissues. So the, uh, they have a printing platform that can create live human tissues on demand. Uh, they are now in cooperation with the top pharmaceutical companies. And why? Because by printing uh, human tissues, whether it is of uh, the kidney or uh, uh, something else, it can actually help the companies make absolutely certain that the, that the drug being created for saving the people who have a problem is correct by design. Uh, the second company that actually was uh, also a member of uh, the Personalized Medicine Initiative on campus is uh, Precision Nanosystem. Uh, this company actually uses uh, RNA and DNA to create nanomolecules. So based on, uh, let's say, uh, God forbid, we know someone that has leukemia cancer. Precision nanosystem based on the RNA and DNA can actually create uh, nanomolecules, nanoparticles, that when injected into the blood can actually kill the cancerous cells uh, of leukemia without any impact on the rest of the body. Uh, recently, uh, the company has actually entered into a cooperation uh, about three months ago with a Chinese company called Cancino Biologic to actually co-develop a COVID-19 RNA vaccine that is also correct by design. And even though it started about three months ago, uh, the vaccine is actually now already being tested. So while at the beginning, uh, it was about the creation of nanomolecules, today it is about saving 20 million people in the world from uh, something that could potentially be of negative impact on them. Uh, also a company accelerated at the uh, University of British Columbia. In uh, clean technology, which is the very last, uh, maybe I should stop here, Dr. Sharif. Uh, please go ahead, let's spend a couple of minutes, get the clean tech, and then we'll start with the Q&A. Uh, okay, so uh, the clean tech, as you can uh, see, uh, it's a very, very big deal. Uh, it started maybe about, uh, Dr. Sam, I think you muted yourself. If you can, uh, yes. All right. Is it okay now? Perfect. Can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Terrific. Uh, so uh, with the United Nations, uh, uh, you know, the initiative to ensure that we have 17 targets uh, to make the world cleaner by 2050, that this has actually uh, launched an absolutely amazing set of uh, uh, innovations to make our lives better. And if I may share with you, for some reason, uh, if I may share with you that in the city that I live in, it's a very small city called uh, Menlo Park. 
when this initiative started, uh, as you can see, uh, there were 350,000 tons of CO2. Today, it's 100,000 less. And the objective is that uh, by 2025, uh, we will get to one tenth of uh, the carbon emission that we had in 2005. And that's the city initiative. Uh, right across from uh, Menlo Park at uh, Stanford University, it is about maybe a kilometer away from uh, Menlo Park. Uh, the sustainability initiative started 10 years ago. And by the way, there is a webinar every single week on uh, sustainability. Uh, when you walk on campus, you actually find out that uh, all the lights are uh, actually uh, generated by renewables. The target is that 100% uh, of the energy being used uh, will be by renewables uh, next year. And 66% of uh, the waste will be diverted. And at the same time, 58% of the faculty and the students actually do not use car that generate any emission. It can be electric vehicles or bicycles. <laughs> One of the companies that we have uh, invested in is uh, Opus 12. And uh, what the company does, uh, this was actually a, a young student, uh, 30 under 30 at uh, Stanford University, is the transformation of uh, CO2 to ethylene, methane, and synthetic uh, gas. Uh, interestingly enough, as the company started uh, less than a year later, companies like uh, Shell and uh, Pacific Gas and uh, Electricity, et cetera, reached out to the company to be able to benefit from the value proposition they have because these are the companies that actually create uh, uh, you know, gas emission and what have you, and uh, did get funding from uh, the NSF, the Department of Energy, NASA, Shell, and the Roddenberry Foundation. If I were to say, uh, just as a takeaway, what kind of future is possible? Uh, it looks like all of us are actually focused on innovations that would have a human impact. Uh, more importantly, uh, that human impact is actually being accelerated through cooperation uh, with uh, universities, uh, medical institutions, uh, government, and corporations. So uh, shall we say the future is bright for all of us? I definitely hope so. I think the future is bright if we make it bright by doing more work in those areas. Uh, thank you. So so much, Dr. Osama. This has been extremely insightful, extremely uh, inspiring. Let me ask you actually a couple of questions that we're getting. And this is a question, uh, uh, two related questions. Uh, one from Kaufar Ali. And uh, her question is, how, how do you see actually the AI solution space in the MENA region or uh, in Egypt? Um, and a very related question from Dr. Tariq Hatem. Uh, in your opinion, what are the most interesting or the top innovations from the things that you've seen that can actually be easily transferred to this part of the world? What can we quickly get into that space? So your perspectives and what can we get into that space? Uh, I'm sure as you can imagine uh, that it is very, very easy uh, right now for these innovations uh, to be uh, used and adopted and promoted. Uh, let, let's focus on Egypt or if you want uh, in the MENA region. Uh, and why I'm saying that uh, for three reasons. Uh, the first one is, uh, as you have seen, a lot of the innovators uh, are actually uh, of uh, Arab origin or from uh, MENA region. And as a consequence, they are very, very, very passionate uh, about ensuring that whatever they know and they do can actually have an impact on the countries where they have come from, like you are. Uh, the second one is that uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, intellectual property and patents and what, and what have you, it has become less important today to protect what we have, but more, to, more or less to find applications for what we have. So as a consequence, let's say in the case of the Venture Lab or uh, you know, the plug and play accelerator in, uh, in Abu Dhabi or Flat Six Lab or what have you, uh, whenever you, and of course at uh, uh, the School of Business uh, at AUC, uh, whenever we have uh, entrepreneurs and students that are interested in some of these applications, uh, there are, uh, it will be as easy as you can possibly imagine for them to say, I would like to be uh, your uh, 
business expansion leader here in the Middle East. And all of the companies that I have shared with you would immediately uh, co uh, cooperate uh, with, the, with the students, with the entrepreneurs, uh, to enable the uh, value proposition to be expanded uh, in the region because it is of benefit to them, but more importantly, because they don't really care about someone is going to steal our intellectual property or what have you, but more importantly, we will feel better if uh, the value proposition has uh, uh, more human impact. And the third thing is that uh, I was actually very surprised when uh, Lina Hedaya, who's an Egyptian, uh, was actually leading a blockchain application and she wanted to expand via Dubai and when I introduced her to the Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund, uh, before they actually assigned to her the money that she needs, and the value proposition is coming from New York, they introduced her to the ministries who prepaid her for the value added service. Today in Asia, for example, uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, you know, remote education or massive open online courses, the agreement between the government, uh, between the ministries of ICT, and Udacity, Udacity is the first company spun out of Stanford to offer massive open online courses, is actually one of the most impactful. And based on that agreement between the Egyptian government and Udacity, which is actually led by my son-in-law, uh, Hisham al Arabi, uh, has led to the company appointing him to be responsible for cooperation with all the governments around the world. So in other words, anything that is of interest uh, in the applications of AI, healthcare, fintech, clean technology, or what have you, that is of interest to you, uh, I can guarantee you that within two weeks, you will have uh, access and contact with the people who would be more than happy to uh, uh, cooperate. Thank you so much. L let me ask you, take the discussion into a different uh, side. You work a lot with companies that are coming out of universities, out of R&D labs, mostly graduate students, maybe PhD students, sometimes masters in interesting innovations. Can you tell us a lot, a little bit about how does that process works? Um, when a scientist who's usually trained to basically work on a very different way of thinking, trying to actually commercialize and take that product to market, which is a completely different mindset and different process. What's your experience working with the scientists getting to market? And what, do you, what would you say to similar scientists or engineers here in Egypt who are actually thinking about taking their products to markets? How can, what, what path should they follow? Well, that's an absolutely uh, excellent question. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, uh, the AUC School of Business is a very, very good model. Uh, Number one, as far as the universities are concerned, uh, it is the quality of the courses uh, that are being um, delivered to the students. And to some extent, uh, you know, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, uh, human capital development, uh, business development, strategic partnerships, and what have you, are either taught in courses that have these names or are actually communicated during uh, the courses, whether they are online or they are uh, face to face. Uh, let's uh, pick up an example. Uh, Nagib Sawir is junior. So uh, uh, he is actually the nephew of uh, the wonderful Nagib Stanford University. And within two years uh, in computer science, uh, he came up with an idea and decided uh, that he would like to actually see this idea being implemented. And before you know it, the faculty members, as well as uh, the uh, alumni, the people who actually graduated from Stanford, who actually participate in the lectures. So a typical lecture would have one professor and at least two outsiders coming in uh, to share their uh, views about uh, the application of what is being taught. And more importantly, to ask the students, how can we help and have the contact details and what have you. So in the case of Nagib Sawiris, when he had this idea and was to some extent uncertain whether or not he would be able to implement this idea and then expand it uh, while being a student, he decided to actually leave. And at the same time, he got 100% full support from the university. So in other words, a culture was one of promoting the human impact uh, of what the students have in mind. 
rather than necessarily having a 4.0 uh, upon uh, graduation, if you will. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as we have uh, to some extent maybe hinted, there are uh, quite a few uh, mentorship organizations whereby, like in the case of uh, TechYD, within one year, there were 100 mentors that have signed up and all of them are ultra high achievers. And what they wanted to do is basically to say, uh, if I had some challenges when I was young about how to get my company to grow, I now have found out ways whereby that growth can be accelerated. The best thing I can do right now is to make absolutely certain I can share it with the people that are doing something similar to what I was doing, but at the same time to accelerate uh, their uh, growth, uh, if you will, their deployment without necessarily facing the same challenges that I have. In many instances today, when uh, people, let's say, make an investment in a company, they will join the board of directors uh, not to govern the company, but to add value to uh, the company. So for example, uh, in the Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund, I can join the board or I am a board member representing North America in this particular case. It can be to approve an investment or it can be to bring entrepreneurs from around the world, including from Asia, like uh, Lina Hedei and what have you, uh, to uh, the Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund because it would be correct by design. So uh, what I'm saying is that for all uh, the students and the entrepreneurs, the mentorship community now uh, is standing by to help. And to some extent, uh, I would say the human impact has been amazing. In the case of Canada, which is only one third the population of uh, Egypt, uh, we were able to help 2,300 companies from Canada to come for business acceleration here in Silicon Valley in the last 10 years and raise $2.3 billion in venture capital financing from Silicon Valley. So Sam, we have many entrepreneurs who are asking on the investment side from different, different angles. So from one angle, which I'm personally curious about, what do you look at when you select your startups? You have a very impressive portfolio, and I'm sure you see probably 100 times more companies to be able to select those. How do you think about selecting a startup that you are personally interested to put your own money? And a second dimension is what kind of advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are looking for investments from our part of the world, specifically if they're seeking investments from the US or international investments specifically? How should they think about it? How should they approach it? What advice would you give them? Well, thank you very much. That's an excellent question, actually. <clears throat> uh, so uh, if I may maybe uh, say to the Egyptians, we all know the pyramids and uh, the pyramid is the structure that I personally uh, use uh, to uh, decide whether or not to invest in the company. And it is based on uh, five levels, if you will. At uh, the bottom is uh, in dealing with the entrepreneurs uh, and uh, the innovators is trust uh, or what we sometimes call the implied covenants of good faith in dealing. In, every, in, in other words, everything that is being said and being done is correct by design. And there is no such thing as what's in it for me. Uh, number two is the coalescence of consensus, uh, or in other words, uh, avoiding confrontation. There are times when the investors have disagreements and there are two ways of resolving it. Uh, one of them is by the coalition of consensus saying, I like your idea, and my idea plus your idea will be one plus one equals three rather than 0 0.6. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, avoid any conflict uh, because uh, uh, the coalescence of consensus immediately lead to business acceleration. And most importantly, statistically, 50% of the startups in the first year end up winding down because of disagreement between the founders. Uh, in other words, excuse me for saying this, Ali Chen. That's absolutely nonsense. Uh, number three is, uh, if you will, uh, the value proposition itself and its impact. So what is it really uh, that it is designed to do and how unique it is? Uh, number four is a definition 
of the role that each individual within the company, particularly as it starts to grow, has as value added. So in other words, uh, I don't invest in companies that have uh, CTOs and CEOs and COOs and what have you. Uh, like in the case of uh, Dr. Sharif, it's not I am the dean, uh, but it is I am working with the advisory board to make uh, uh, the students happier at school and have a better future, if you will. And then number five, which of course is very important for all of us, is what we call the objectives and the key results. Uh, in other words, we need to be very much committed, uh, not to dream only, but also to identify what are the results that we are going to try to achieve and how, and then justify them in a way that is absolutely convincing. In this case, when we have a trustworthy team with a unique value proposition and individuals whose value contribution is well-defined, where there is a coalescence of consensus and attractive objectives and key results, we end up making the investment. Occasionally, uh, we also prefer that they come from environment that we trust, let's say from the Venture Lab or from the Stanford StartX or from uh, uh, the AI labs at uh, you know, McGill University and what have you. Thank you, Dr. Hassanin. Uh, let me jump to another side that's very interesting for all of us, specifically Dr. Sharif Kamel and myself, which is about the educational side. And there's several questions from Ahmed Shaheen and others about edtech. We've seen the whole disruption from the COVID-19 for the educational process, universities and schools and all of that. Uh, but it is actually not something new. It is accelerating different trends for remote learning, MOOCs, and different, so many different innovations on that space. What's your perspective on that space? Are you seeing startups? How is AI and other types of innovations that you're seeing affecting innovations in the educational side? And how do we take some of those innovations and bring them actually to the grassroots, to the 22 million students in K through 12 educational system in Egypt, or the likes in India and Pakistan and Mexico and South Africa? What's your perspective on EdTech? Uh, of course, it is the best of times right now. Uh, it has evolved uh, in an absolutely miraculous way in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, I don't know the statistics today, but uh, as of uh, 2018, there were 100,000 courses being offered for free online. Uh, some of them may be relevant. And in the case of uh, China, 300 million people have actually signed up. Uh, in the case of the Middle East, uh, in uh, cooperation with uh, uh, UC Berkeley uh, and also with Udacity, uh, in Saudi Arabia, of all places on earth, uh, working with uh, a wonderful man by the name of uh, Saeed Saeed, we actually developed six courses, uh, and the courses are for talent. And the talent can be in uh, tourism and hospitality, in connected cities, uh, in insurance, and what have you. And the idea here was actually to uh, enable the students, equal number of girls and boys, in the schools and in the universities, to know about these massive open online courses and to choose the ones that are consistent with the talent they think they have or that they would like to develop. Surprisingly, we were able to attract a number of corporate partners to participate and finance the program. And the net result is 420,000 students who have taken these courses ended up being hired upon graduation outside of the government. Uh, so uh, I can uh, certainly send you some, uh, you know, information about uh, EdTech, but it is the best of times and more importantly, the human impact of educational technology and to some extent, uh, for example, my daughter is actually has been learning for about a year uh, about from a course about how mothers can deal with children that are autistic. Uh, today with uh, children that are frustrated by uh, studying from home and, uh, and what have you. So in other words, it has become very, very amazing collaborative learning and uh, the scope of these ed tech courses is endless. And at the same time, they are free and available and they would have mentors to assist the ones that would like to take the course. 
Wonderful. I think we're getting very close to the end. Let me ask you a concluding question. And then I know Dr. Sheaf Campbell wants to actually uh, have a concluding remark. Uh, we have many entrepreneurs with us today. Some of them are students, some of them are uh, mid-career professionals, and they're all thinking about jumping into that space. From someone who's been a veteran in that space, what, what advice would you give them? Uh, as I shared with you, to be honest with you, uh, the opportunities will uh, come from you, from uh, from uh, from the outside to you, uh, but uh, equally importantly, uh, let's let's start with us. Uh, whenever you have an idea, uh, a thought, or a question, or a have you, uh, please do reach out. Uh, at the same time, uh, I have actually scheduled to talk to the Techwadi board tomorrow to make absolutely certain they are connected uh, to AUC School of Business. And as a consequence, you'll be able to reach, you know, 100 mentors with any question uh, that uh, you have. When it comes to fundraising, uh, you know, if you look statistically, there are maybe 10,000 companies uh, financed by venture capital in the U.S. every year, but 120,000 companies financed by angel investors and the angel network is uh, absolutely amazing. So as a consequence, with ideas, you will find someone who will write the check for $25,000 and maybe eventually 100 will do the same and to some extent cooperate with you to make absolutely certain that all what you need to make things happen is achieved. This is fantastic. And I think actually creating opportunities for startups from Egypt and the region to actually connect with mentors, entrepreneurs, and potential investors uh, from TechWide, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, Dr. Usama, this has been a fantastic discussion. And I think uh, on behalf of many people who are with us on the call, I wanted to thank you for your time. And I hope that we see you soon in Cairo, inshallah. And uh, I'll get it, give, it back, uh, give the floor back to Dr. Sharif Kamil for concluding remark. Thank you, Dr. Usama. Thank you. Dr. Usama. Always a delight to listen to you and to learn from you. This has been rich. Uh, the only sad thing, it's only one hour. And, and, and it just uh, passed so quickly. But I know this has not been the first time. This will not be the last time that we, uh, we exchange uh, some of your wonderful thoughts and, and get uh, uh, a glimpse of your uh, very vast experience. I'll just share with you one last uh, thought before we go. So uh, over 10 years ago, we, 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 we dreamed together of the, 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 uh, the Venture Lab or something that became the Venture Lab. And here we have it uh, up and running, uh, extremely successful. We're very proud of it. And, and, uh, and I am taking it to the next level uh, every year. Uh, I'll share with you my next thought, which, uh, which actually we discussed it before. And I sincerely hope we see it uh, happening is that to see similar uh, examples uh, even better uh, of the V Lab across Egypt. Uh, Egypt is big. Uh, with all that happened over the last 20 years, I still think we're scratching the surface. And I've 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 been around uh, all the way down 600 kilometers to the deep deep south of Egypt, and there are some good brains down there who would need an opportunity, who would need a platform like the Venture Lab. And I'm I have no doubt if they have that platform they can just excel like anybody else around the world. I've seen it myself. Uh, um, I went there last year. I had some expectations, but nothing close to what I saw. I went back just before we were hit by COVID, actually in March 2020, and I just had an amazing experience. Uh, these are people who, who really innovate because they need it. Uh, uh, but if they have the tools and if they have the the, the, the ecosystem that can help them out, I think they can, they can just do wonders. Uh, there are so many universities in Egypt. I do believe in university-based incubators. Uh, I just hope that scaling up the experience of the VLAB uh, could be seen in Egypt, private and public uh, universities. And I sincerely hope that with your leadership, uh, we can do this together. Absolutely. So thank you very, very much. God bless you all. Rabbi Nech Ali Kum. Ya très bientôt. Très bientôt. Au revoir. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussain. Ma'asalam. Thank you. Thank you.